Hello Earth Guardian, fellow Earth Guardians. I have another video today that is related to my last video, which was a few months ago. I just had to, I feel like I had to step away from YouTube for a little while to get some things sorted out. <clears throat> but I'm back. So I'm basing this video on my last one, which was the subdisciplines of geology. Basically, so this is a video I'm creating on the different types of volcanoes. You might be wondering, different types? Yes, there are more. There is more than one type. There is more than that typical textbook example of the conical-shaped volcano. There are different types, not just that one. So I'm just gonna give a short outline <coughs> of the different types. So we've got stratovolcanoes, caldera, shield volcanoes, submarine volcanoes, subglacial cinder, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> we'll be talking about these nine different types of volcanoes today. Okay, so the first one is basically the, the, the basic textbook example that you see stratovolcanoes, otherwise known as composite volcanoes, as they are named for the alternating layers of lava and pyroclasts, or explosive volcanic deposits, that are commonly found. Because <clears throat> it almost looks like a stratigraphic layer, stratigraphic section, essentially. <clears throat> They do produce different types of eruptions, so I really should have put basaltic here, sorry. But it's generally from basaltic to rhyolitic, because some stratovolcanoes can produce lava flows as well as explosive eruptions. And they typically are found at subduction zones, where the where two plates that are converging, the heavier plate subducts into the mantle, so ends up going downward and continues. An example would be Cascadia. Um, can't think of the name of the one in Indonesia that caused the 2004 earthquake, but you get the point. So it's basically a schematic of a stratovolcano, kind of the typical things you'd find at them, essentially. They can vary, excuse me, from volcano to volcano, but it's typically, they're very similar. <clears throat> and the fact that they can produce different, they can produce eruptions from basaltic to rhyolitic. And I will explain those terms in a later video, but basically they just mean, they're just terms based on the silica content of magma, which can vary from 40 or 50 percent to 60 70 percent weight weight percent of silica so yeah I'll get into that in a later video for anybody who's interested the second type are shield volcanoes they're typically named for their shape which is basically like a, a shield that's lying down so it just basically gives that similar shape the low relief, very shallow, very low, very low sides, no very shallow sides essentially. They're typically basaltic in composition, so the lava is typically very runny, very low silica content. They're typically found at hot spots like Hawaii, prime example, and or diverging plate boundaries where two Tectonic plates are moving away from each other, not towards each other, not towards each other. So, except for a very unique spot, <clears throat> which is Iceland, which is on diverging plate boundary and has a hot spot underneath it. Very, very unique place to have <laughs> volcanic activity, essentially. So yeah, you. So basically, if you think of Hawaii, oops like Kilauea, Mauna Loa, those are typical shield volcanoes. Calderas. They're typically created by 
the collapsing of the ground and an eruption column into a magma chamber below creating a circular depression, like a, like a cauldron-shaped depression. Emphasis on the name calderas, because they basically have a cauldron shape. <clears throat> it's basically when the magma chamber empties after a large eruption and the ground above the magma chamber is not able to stay up. So basically, there's nothing holding the ground up anymore. So the ground collapses into the, into the emptied or partially emptied magma chamber below, creating a bowl-shaped depression. They're generally created after large-scale eruptions. Example would be Yellowstone National Park. Partially, I believe, partially sits in a caldera, a volcanic caldera created 640 to 600,000 years ago. Third is the last in a chain of three. So there were two eruptions before that. Not in the exact same spot, but southwest, I believe, the path goes southwest. And they are different from volcanic vents, which volcanic vents are passages which magma travels from the magma chamber to the Earth's surface. So there is a difference between the two. <coughs> Excuse me. Over here on the right is just a schematic showing after a caldera collapse and after resurgence, this would have this bottom one would happen over a period of time where you get something kind of a resurgent dome, which is basically the this part into caldera ash flow or even the ground that collapsed, basically bulging up again over time as the magma chamber has, has been has refilled. An example of that would be the Toba supervolcano. So if you look up Lake Toba on line, you'll see you'll see a lake and it looks like an island in the middle. It's basically, the island is basically a resurgent dome. The next one are submarine volcanoes. They're self-explanatory underwater volcanoes. Sorry. So they're found in mid-ocean ridges mainly, or even I think the area around subduction zones. Basically, when magma comes in contact with external water, you generally get an explosion. And I don't know the full um, the full information about summary volcanoes, but yeah. I definitely would have to do more research on summary volcanoes to give you more of a clue. But here's a basic just a basic schematic of what a submarine volcano would um would, would do. And if you want to know of a very good example, a recent example actually within the last two years, is Honga Tonga, January 2022. I don't remember the ex exact date, excuse me, excuse me, but yeah. That's a really good example of a submarine eruption. It's a really, really good ash cloud too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm obsessed with explosive volcanoes. So excuse me. <clears throat> Basically. The next one would be subglacial. Now there are a couple different types of subglacial, what would be considered subglacial volcanoes. Volcanoes that are under glaciers or gla or are there can be stratovolcanoes that are um, capped by glaciers. Big surprise. <laughs> I'm a little sarcastic, so excuse me. They occur on high peaks or further north or south of the equator. So they can either be found far away from the equator or just really on high mountains. So here's an example of one under thick ice, thin ice, a cone-shaped volcano with glacier top that's been glacier capped. So it kind of depends on the different type of one where you generally will get activity or an explosive eruption out of it. Because sometimes you can get volcanoes like this, but you really won't 
get a lot of activity or it just won't show at the surface. You can have a small eruption underneath the surface, but because the, the ice is so thick, it won't breach it to the surface. Some examples of a glacier ice capped volcanic eruption, looking up Nevado del Ruiz, 1985, was an example of this, where there was a glacier cap peak, which there was an eruption caused the melting of the glacier and causing a, a lahar, which is um, a yokalop or, or a lahar, which is basically a volcanic mud flow, essentially. So yeah, that, that was a very tragic event, that eruption was. And another would be the eruption of Ayafiat Liukudl in 2010, so the um, Icelandic eruption in 2010, and Grimsvotn 2011. All are, all are good examples of, all are good examples of some glacial eruptions. <coughs> I could get into other things about about like the deposits, but I'm not going to because <laughs> I'm a bit obsessed with it. So go forget. So basically, syndicones is what we're going to work on next. Formed by the accumulation of rocks called cinders, or also known as scoria. It's just kind of a um. It's a rock that can typically look red, but it's a very vesicular rock that's typically basaltic, I believe, to, yeah, possibly even andesitic in composition. It's also, it's called scoria. Scoria kinds are typically formed from basaltic eruptions, but can have a little bit of pyroclastic um, deposits in there somewhere. I don't know much, I don't, I don't know much about syndicones, but I do know there are some in Iceland, and this is an example of a syndicone on the Canary Islands. So, I would say that the current eruption in Iceland could be considered maybe forming a syndicone. So, if you want to use an example, another one, that could be a possible example. I don't know if it's considered a syndicone, but that's kind of a... Um, that can be an example of how they, of how they form. Okay, now this is an interesting one. Fissure volcanoes. Basically, an elongated fracture at the surface of which lava can erupt. It typically occur at divergent plane boundaries, at a hotspot, or LIPs. LIPs are a different, a definitely larger kettle of fish. Um, definitely larger scale. Um, but basically, an example, if you've seen lava interruption in Hawaii that looks like it's a, a long, like an, like an elongated f uh, fracture or they call it fissure, that's basically an example of a fissure eruption. How they have different faults that have opened up, different fractures, and they'll see lava, lava founding spewing along a line. That's, a, that's basically a fissure eruption. Another example would be Laki in Iceland, 1783 to 84. That's a good example of and that's L-A-K-I, by the way. That's another example of a good one. And there are larger ones, like large igneous province eruptions, which I'll get to a little bit later on the last slide and, and explain a little bit about that. So, yeah, they're not the most common things in the world, and yet they tend to have them on Hawaii. They're just not really talked about too much, I don't think. Typically. Mar volcanoes. Oh dear. These ones. <laughs> Learning about these ones were a little confusing for me, but I will try to explain the best I can. Mar volcanoes are low relief, broad craters formed by shallow explosive eruptions underground. So the eruption never qu fully quite reaches the surface, where you get like either cinder cones fissure eruptions, stratovolcanoes where it builds up a um or it builds up the cone shape. It's something that's caused by heating and boiling of groundwater and matter when 
magma, sorry, comes in contact with underground water. And you can have different explosions at different, at different depths, as this shows, showing different ways, different, um, different relief patterns, shallow, not shallow, based on different depths. And if it's deep enough, you actually won't get the explosion on the surface. It won't show. It won't show at all. So, Mar volcanoes are definitely, definitely strange beasts. I, do, I haven't gone deep into research about Mar volcanoes myself because I'm literally more of an explosive, explosive volcanism person. I like dealing with py pyroclastic deposits, it's just my interest. And glaciers, it's just kind of my area. And they often have a tough ring surrounding them. So basically just deposits caused Tough ring is basically the deposits from the explosion just kind of landing around the crater itself. <clears throat> now the final slide of this presentation. Last one. Super volcanoes, which I talked mainly previously about in calderas, but I will go into a little bit more detail. And LIPs. These are interesting beasts because supervolcanoes are not something that humans have witnessed in modern times. So I believe the last supervolcanic eruption was now excuse me for the from for those who are in New Zealand, I do not know how to pronounce this. Ari Nui eruption. It was around 23 to 26,000 years ago in New Zealand. So that eruption was probably the most recent one with Toba right behind it at 74,000 years ago, Lake Toba. So basically a supervolcano is a volcano that's capable of releasing over 1,000. It wouldn't let me put the three as the um, superscript by the way. So that's why I had to write it this way. 1,000 cubic kilometers of material in a single event, known as, and, and I will explain this also in a later presentation, known as a VEI-8 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. I will go into depth about that in a later video, but it's just basically the, how volcanologists scale eruptions essentially based on just based on certain aspects of them they have the potential to to have major climatic effects and create ecosystem problems so examples would be again yellowstone there are some other volcanoes that have caused climatic effects that are not super volcanoes, but again, I will mention that in another video. I'm not going to make this video too long. Um, <clears throat> but I'd say the best example would be close to this would be Tambora, 1815. Anybody who's interested, I can do a video on that later on and explain more in detail about that, but that was not a super volcanic eruption, but it's one of the closest ones, I think that we can go, that I can compare it to. Now, large igneous provinces. These are very large eruptions. Large igneous provinces or LIPs are basically massive emplacements of mainly basaltic magma. They form no one, I don't even think anyone truly knows how they form. There are different places where there, where it's been known to have a large igneous province eruption. Um, and this is just basically a schematic of one. The most accurate, the most accurate, the best one I can find. <clears throat> just, just over the life cycle of a large igneous province eruption. And they also have the potential for 
climatic impacts as well. And so, yeah. And some examples of a large igneous province would be, what was it, the Columbia River basalts? Those are out west in the US. There are the, De the Deccan traps in, in, in India and the Siberian traps in Siberia and Russia. Those are definitely some good examples of large igneous provinces if anybody has any interest. So I listed different examples if anybody has interest in looking them up. I definitely could do some presentations maybe later on down the line of different of specific volcanoes, but for right now it's just more information that I've learned over time about them since I went to school for this. <laughs> I went to school for earth sciences and my master's was geological sciences. And sorry, my voice sounds really hoarse. <clears throat> but I'm just basically sharing my information that I have and the fact that I love volcanoes to anybody who might have the same love for volcanoes. I just don't want to talk about them. So these, in the last two pages, is just basically a bibliography. So if anybody has any interest in looking up the images, these are all the um, references and bibliography for the images that I took, that, the images that I got, sorry, for this presentation. I don't know if I need to do this for YouTube, but I did it anyway. So yeah, if anybody has interest in any other videos like this about any other videos about volcanoes please put a like and comment down in the comments of what type of videos you would like me to make about volcanoes do you want to know composition do you want to know different land different land forms do you want to know um so no, i should probably do one of tectonic plates so people can get an idea of that um, but yeah, I can definitely do other videos. I could do stuff about the climatic impacts of volcanoes. I can do stuff about lava, andesite, different volcanic deposits. I, I could, I could do more research and do them. So if anybody has interest, please like and subscribe and let me know in the comments again. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.